Since I was in high school, this is where I wanted to be, working at a university as a professor. Perhaps I had romanticized it from television shows when I was a kid, but I wanted to be surrounded by smart people talking about important things and working on important research. Knowing this is what I wanted, I applied for college and ended up studying psychology at the University of Iowa in the United States. Luckily for me, I enrolled in a special unified program for honor students. So despite Iowa being a large university, most of my courses were small and I had plenty of contact with excellent professors in political science, religion, history, astronomy, and psychology. These professors were noted scholars in their fields, yet they were also excellent teachers who inspired me and my classmates to want to do great things with our lives. And so I became even more determined to become a professor. Now, more than 40 years since I first went to college, I'm about to apply for promotion to full professor at a different university on the other side of the world. It's been a very long journey. And you're probably surprised to find out that I'm not even technically a professor, even though I'm about to turn 60 in a few weeks. <gasps> well, in this video, I'm going to tell you about, first of all, what was required for me to get to this point. And then secondly, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about the process I'm going to be going through for the next few months to get promoted to full professor. First, let me tell you about the technical reason I'm not a professor. It has to do with the fact that I moved to Australia. And if you watch this video that I have up here, you can see in that video that I talk about some of the differences between, for instance, the American and the Australian university system. And one of those is this title, professor. When I was in the US, before I moved here to Australia, I was always referred to as a professor, a professor with a small p. Now, sometimes that was a research assistant professor or a visiting assistant professor, or I was an assistant professor, and then I got promoted to associate professor. So students and other people out in the world would refer to me as Professor Vanman. Then I moved here, and when I got here, my title was senior lecturer. And as a senior lecturer, you're addressed formally as doctor. So I was Dr. Vanman this, Dr. Vanman that, Dr. Vanman on my door. And then later, I was promoted to associate professor. And when I was promoted to associate professor, now I have the word professor in my title. But again, most people just call associate professors here Dr. Vanman for short. Now, when I get promoted to full professor, big capital P, then in Australia, they will address me as professor. And it's even found in things like when you uh, sign up for a hotel room or something, you'll find that the title that you can pick to call yourself instead of Mr. is professor. And so then I'll be able to call myself a professor once I reach that level. Well, so what's required for me to finally become a professor? I've had to go through a series of different ranks, obviously, over the years. And over these years, I've steadily worked at lots of different places. A large chunk of that time when I was working at different universities, I had short-term appointments or my appointments were really focused on teaching classes, which made it really hard to have a sustained research program. So for a long time then I struggled trying to get enough papers out there that I could get hired by a research university. I was hired by one in 2001, and then I moved here in 2007, which is one of the top research universities in the world. So obviously I'm expected to do a lot more research, and therefore I have less teaching than I had when I was in the United States, and I've been steadily doing what I can to do my research. The other thing though that happens besides doing teaching and research is you're expected to do some service for either your department or the university. And here in the School of Psychology, I was asked by our head of school to become the deputy head of school for research and research training, which meant that I was in charge of helping people with their research grants. I also was in charge of 150 PhD students in terms of their candidatures and getting them finished. It was a lot of work. And I did that a lot in the first four years while I was here. It didn't help me very much because it slowed me down in terms of my publications. And therefore, when it was time for me to finally go through my five-year probationary review, which is equivalent to here, like going up for tenure, my head of school was worried that I didn't have what it would take to make it through probation. So he told me that I should go ahead and ask for a two-year extension, which I did. But within just a few months of that, 
I hit a grant. I also got some significant papers published. And so I thought mm, that wasn't probably not a good idea to wait a whole two years. So I went ahead and told the university I was ready to go up for my uh, confirmation anyway. However, I was told that because I had petitioned for this two year extension, I would have to wait it out. So in the end, I had to wait seven years to go up for my confirmation. And then once I was confirmed or tenured now, I was now eligible for my first sabbatical. First time I had a semester off from teaching since I had been hired here. And by the way, they changed the rules during that time to the fact that the probationary period was now only three years. So people after me only had to wait three years to go up and it seemed to be a lot less onerous. And I haven't heard of anybody asking for extensions on their probation period like I had to go through. Anyway, given that advice, I was really skittish then about going up for promotion to associate professor, so I waited a couple extra years on that. And when I finally went up for that in 2018, I did it. I was promoted to associate professor, which took effect in January of 2019. Now, when I was promoted to associate professor, I was told that I would have to wait three whole years before I was be allowed to apply for a full professor uh, rank. And that's what I did. I waited three years. So now in 2023, I'm actually getting all my paperwork submitted to be promoted. Except again, now, after waiting this time, they've changed the rule to two years. So people after me will have a shorter period now to wait until be promoted to full professor. But here I am now submitting the paperwork to become a full professor. So I think you can probably tell now what are the important things that you need to do in order to get promoted or to at least make it to this far. I had to do a lot of teaching. I had to do a lot of research and I had to do service. And that is still how I'm being evaluated for my next appointment to be promoted to full professor. However, when I go up for full professor, it's partly based on my entire picture, everything I've done up until this point, but it's also based on what I've done since 2019. So I had to have a compelling story, or I have to have a compelling story now to give to the committee that's looking at my promotion. So this is what it is all about. In order to be an academic, in order to have tenure or confirmation here in Australia, you've got to publish a lot, you have to be good at teaching, and you have to do some service for your university. Now I'll also mention though, there are some people out there who are sort of the exception to the rule. And the exception is that some people are sort of like superstars in research, and they get fellowships or other kinds of grants early on that basically allows them to get out of teaching and they don't teach then at all and they really just do research and given the fact that they're hundred percent doing research they've got a lot of time to go ahead and do that research and get a lot of papers out and they get way ahead of the rest of us who have to do all the teaching as well so it's just a one of those things that's sort of unfair and the fact that we get compared or put on the same criteria as people who get research only type of appointments um, I know of at least one colleague who's pretty much gone the last 15 years without having to teach a single course. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've taught dozens and dozens of courses during that same period of time. So you can see a lot of differences in the way people get to this path, get to this point in their career. Um, I'm particularly slow. I always have been slow. It took me longer to get my undergraduate degree than most people. It took me longer to do my PH degree than it did most people. It took me longer to start a family than most people. I'm just sort of that kind of slow, deliberate person who gets caught up in doing a lot of other things at the same time. And therefore, I haven't hurried along as quickly as I might have. And so here I am about to hit 60. By the way, I'll be posting other videos about this whole process in the coming months. So if you're really curious about what's going to happen to me, whether or not I'll really be around next year as a full professor, you can subscribe to my channel and you won't miss anything. So what is the process? Well, right now I'm actually preparing the documents that need to be submitted in support of my application. And there are three main things that I need to submit. First of all, there's this 800 word summary. And the 800 word summary is basically the compelling case in a very few amount of words here about why the committee should want to promote me. Two, I need to give a bigger document that talks about all the evidence in support of why I meet the criteria for full professor. And number three, there's this thing called the individual activity profile. I think that's what it's called. And it's basically a summary with nice graphs and everything of everything I've been doing over the last few years here at the university. 
I have to have all of these submitted by May 31st. And then my dean and my head of school will be going through those documents and writing up reports in support of my promotion. I've talked to both of them and they're going to support me. And once they've done their reports, then I will get a chance to change anything or modify my uh, file uh, and do that by June 30th. And so on June 30th, everything gets submitted and I have nothing more to do. On June 30th, what will happen is then my entire case will be assigned to a couple members of the promotions committee that have been appointed just for the promotion of people to full professor at the university. They're expecting to have about 50 applications this year and two of the members of the committee, they're all professors, full professors, two of the members of the committee will be tasked with handling my application in detail. And so when they meet at the end of August, Everybody's supposed to have gone through all of our application materials, but my two advocates, if you might say that, are going to be the people who talk through my, my application with the rest of the committee members. Now, at the end of August, I'll get a chance to come in and talk to the committee. I have to do like a little five minute presentation, which I plan to record and practice and put up here on YouTube before I do that. Um, but I have to go ahead and give them this five minute presentation and then sit for a half an hour, I think it is, uh, while they ask me questions in an interview. And then they invite my dean to come in and they interview him and talk to him about my promotion. And then we don't hear anything for a while until somewhere like in October or November where I'll get news about whether or not I've been promoted to full professor. So I have quite a few months here to go until I actually know. And then once I find out, one of two things could happen. If I'm promoted, then I become a full professor on January 1st, which is when the academic year begins here. Or I'll be told that no, I didn't get promoted, but I could try again in two years. So I'd have to wait two more years to try again, go through this whole process. Sure. Now I thought I'd share with you some of these materials that I'm gonna be submitting. So I'm actually gonna show you my drafts right now of my 800 word statement, my supporting evidence document and all that IAP stuff. So let's start here with the 800 word summary. Now the 800 word summary is meant to be this sort of, you know, quick summary where you could see everything I've done and why I deserve to be promoted. And it's really quite important. And both my dean and my head of school have given me feedback that I need to do a better job with the draft that I have, that it just doesn't have a lot of punch to it. I'm not bragging about myself enough or I'm just not you know, talking about myself in a confident enough manner that would catch the attention of these members of this committee who are going to be looking like at 50 different applications. So I'm still spending the next couple of weeks really working hard on this 800 word summary to make it pop, to make it look like I really deserve to have this promotion to me now. The next document that you'll see here is the document in which I have to provide all the evidence. Now there are four categories or criteria that I have to go for here. First one is teaching. Then there'll be research. Then there's supervision. And then I have um, service, like stuff I have to do for the community or for my university. And then the last set of materials I have to submit is the individual activity profile. You can see that the first one I have here is my teaching ratings over the last six, seven years. And that green bar at the top is the most important part. Those show that my evaluations are in the top category of evaluations, especially question eight, which is over on the far right corner. And then we have my number of courses that I've coordinated, which basically shows that I've been doing about the same amount of work as everybody else in terms of coordinating courses and teaching them. Then we have my scholarly works, which reviews my publication since 2016. And the blue color that you see there is mostly for uh, papers that were published in peer-reviewed journals. And so therefore I keep showing that I'm publishing in good journals, somewhere between five and eight papers a year. And then we have this graph, which looks really strange, but it's basically showing that in terms of how many people that I supervise for their PhDs, that I'm near the top on that one on the far left. You can see that in my cohort of people, at least in my faculty, I think I have currently the most number of PhD students that I'm actively supervising. Of course, this number will drop drastically when these eight finish this year. And then finally, we have my grant activity. And you can see this is where they keep really nice statistics about how much money I've raised and where the grant's coming from and so on. So that's my IAP. And that will be something that will just automatically be generated and sent in when I submit everything else. 
So that is pretty much everything I'm gonna to have to do between now and May 31st. Get this all ready, get it submitted, pretty much be done with it. Then I'll be preparing that five minute presentation that I have to make sometime at the end of August, beginning of September. But I will make other videos and keep you apprised of what happens to me. So again, I thank you for your support and for watching this video to the very bitter end. And until I see you next time, stay curious.